Well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you all, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. As university principal, it's my pleasure to welcome you warmly to the University of Glasgow's World Changing Glasgow Conversations. This is our flagship virtual event series that connects individuals and ideas at a time when this has never been more important, whilst also allowing us to connect with you, our Team U of G global community. In the audience, we have alumni, staff, partners, and other friends, and a special welcome to those prospective students in the audience as well. I was delighted to be a speaker at the first of these events uh, alongside Glasgow alumnus Kevin Sneeder, Global Managing Partner of McKinsey. And I'm proud to say that we're drawing again on the fantastic expertise in our alumni community with our speakers this evening. With us from Pfizer uh, are two of our senior alumni at the university, Rod McKenzie, PhD, Chief Development Officer and Executive Vice President of Pfizer, who graduated in chemistry in 1981. And John Young, who's a group president and chief business officer at Pfizer, who graduated in biology in 1986. And from the university, we have our Vice Principal and Head of College of Medical Veterinary and Life Sciences and leading immunologist, Professor Ian McInnes. And Professor Emma Thompson, Professor in Infectious Diseases at the University Center for Virus Research, both also Glasgow graduates. So thank you all for making the time to be with us today, particularly to John and Rod joining us from New York. I will now hand over to today's panel host to tell us more about that and uh, to get proceedings on the way. So let me introduce my colleague at the university, the university vice principal of external relations, Rachel Sanderson. Over to you, Rachel. Many thanks for your introduction, Anton. And can I just add my own welcome to everyone to this incredibly timely world changing Glasgow conversation. I am delighted to be your host for what I think is going to be a really engaging, though possibly far too short hour together. Um, we've had an excellent response to this event and are welcoming over a thousand participants from over 80 countries. So this truly is a global conversation. Please, please do say hello in the chat if you wish. Let us know where you're joining us from. Um, but due to the large volume of attendees, sadly, it won't be possible to pick up individual questions asked in the text chat. Uh, however, we will endeavour to address key themes in the Q&A, so no pressure for our panellists at all. Um, and the response to today's event is no surprise, given today's topic, the extraordinary journey, vaccines and COVID-19. The first COVID-19 vaccinations in December were a powerful representation of an exceptional and historic endeavour. The development, authorisation, production and delivery of novel vaccines in record time. The University of Glasgow is proud to have played a part in bringing the new vaccines into being. Tonight, uh, or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, um, our expert panel will share how these vaccines have made this extraordinary journey and will discuss what needs to happen next to ensure they can help bring the pandemic under control around the world. In a moment, we'll hear from John, who will then hand over to Rod, and then we'll bring in Ian and Emma to participate in the discussion. So John, I am delighted to hand over to you to talk to us about the extraordinary journey of the Pfizer vaccine. Thank you. Thank you so much. It really is an honour to be back home, even if uh, only remotely. Uh, next slide. And I, I say home because Glasgow University has a special place in my heart and always will as the institution that gave me my basic scientific training. Uh, where I began to learn critical thinking skills, where I began to develop a passion to apply scientific advances to treat human illness, and also where I formed friendships and relationships that endure to this day. Um, those same attributes have also been pivotal, actually, in Pfizer's extraordinary journey that led to the world's first vaccine against uh, COVID-19. Next slide. And I consider myself very lucky to have spent 34 years working for Pfizer because it's a company whose purpose and values align with what's important to me personally, breakthroughs that change patients' lives. It's a phrase that encapsulates why Pfizer exists and which plainly has never been more urgent than in the last year that we've all lived through. Next slide. So it was around about this time last year that the world began to realize that COVID-19 was not just a China problem, 
but a pandemic of a magnitude that would literally change the world as we've known it and would destroy the lives and livelihoods of people everywhere. Uh, since this began, there have been approximately 110 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, and almost two and a half million deaths with almost 10,000 people still dying due to the virus every single day. So in that um, sobering context, Rod and I will spend a few minutes taking you on the journey that has led us here. I will tell you what we did to initiate this program, uh, talk a little bit about manufacturing, and then Rod will talk about how we advanced our vaccine from concept through clinical development to approval and manufacture in 266 days, 266 very busy days, I might add. So next slide. So when we were first confronted by COVID-19, our CEO, Albert Bourla, established three priorities for our company. Um, first, protecting the safety and well-being of our colleagues. Um, as the COVID-19 outbreak hit China in January last year, we established a crisis management team to provide support and guidance for the more than 5,000 Pfizer colleagues in China, as well as to coordinate the company's initial response. Then as the pandemic began to spread, that team worked hard and fast to ensure the health and safety of our colleagues around the world, including issuing work from home guidance ahead of government directives. Easy to say with the benefit of hindsight, but at the time, something that felt like quite a bold decision to ask people who had been working in office locations to literally start working from home. But with the benefit of hindsight, you know, some guidance that plainly was, was precedent and uh, well-intended. The second priority that we had was keeping our existing manufacturing lines open so that important treatments for other diseases would continue to be available to the patients who needed them. And that meant ensuring that our 20,000 colleagues who work in our Pfizer Global Supply Organization could work safely at our manufacturing sites. So all non-essential colleagues at those sites were asked to work from home. And strict protocols for distancing were swiftly introduced, along with tools for contact tracing and other measures. And I'm very proud to say that during the pandemic, we have never experienced a major production delay. And more importantly, we've not seen any cases of on-site transmission to our own colleagues. But our third priority was the collaboration with experts inside and outside of Pfizer to contribute potential medical solutions to the pandemic which Rod will cover in detail during his presentation. And we were very clear that this was a moment when we and others needed to demonstrate the value of the research-based biopharma industry to the world, and that one way or another, the world would remember how we showed up during the pandemic. And I have to say that really did help to galvanize the whole company into action with an enormous sense of purpose to really make a difference through our science. Next slide, please. So I mentioned relationships in my comments about my experiences at uh, Glasgow as an undergrad student, and that our relationship with our German partner, BioNTech, was critical in enabling us to achieve something together that neither company could have achieved alone. Um, our companies had an existing research partnership, which was still preclinical, to develop an mRNA vaccine for seasonal flu, given, as you all know, that is it existing flu vaccines are variably effective depending on the flu strains that given season. So together we have successfully combined Pfizer's vaccine development, manufacturing and logistics expertise with BioNTech's expertise in innovative mRNA technology. And much credit has rightly been given to our research and development teams, which you'll hear more about from Rod. Next slide. But Equally important is the extraordinary innovation and accomplishments of our manufacturing and supply chain colleagues, and they really are the unsung heroes of this work. We made a very early decision to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in building a manufacturing supply chain for a vaccine technology which had never previously been manufactured at commercial scale, let alone to make the billions of doses that we knew the world would need from us and from others if we were to defeat the virus. So we began uh, pilot manufacturing at risk in the middle of last year and established first of their kind mass manufacture of DNA templates. We developed mRNA drug product manufacturing processes, 
lipid nanoparticle vaccine suites. We built our freezer farms at our manufacturing plants in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, not far from where Rod is uh, speaking to you from today, and Poor's, Belgium. We developed ultra cold supply chain innovations, including a thermal shipper with GPS tracking of location and temperature, uh, every step from our factory to the place of delivery and countless other advances as well. As of the 31st of January this year, we had supplied 65 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine worldwide. And here in the UK, we're on track to meet our contractual obligations to deliver 40 million doses to the British government by the end of the year. Globally, we project being able to manufacture more than 2 billion doses in 2021, which is an improvement of more than 50% versus the 1.3 billion that we projected even just late last year. Thanks to continued process improvements by our manufacturing team and the validation processes, uh, the continued process improvements by our manufacturing team and the validation of a low dead volume syringe combination that enables a sixth dose to be reliably extracted from each vial. But I would say that we also know that this is a, not a time for any of us to rest on our laurels as long as the pandemic continues to threaten anyone on the face of the planet. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll finish with a photo that uh, really provided a moment of pride for us, uh, especially for Rod and me as the UK Nationals and Pfizer's executive leadership team, when on the 8th of December last year, Margaret Keenan, a 90-year-old grandmother of four, originally from Enniskillen in Northern Ireland, became the first patient to receive our vaccine. It was a moment of great pride, but it was also a motivation to all of us that our job is far from done because so many people continue to be impacted by the virus and need the protection that a vaccine can potentially afford, while at the same time, the virus itself continues to mutate rapidly including some potentially significant mutations which enhance transmissibility. However, all of this work has been underpinned by great research and great clinical development. So I'd now like to hand over to Rod to tell you more about that work. Rod, over. Okay, John, thank you very much indeed and uh, welcome everyone. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be with you today. And as Anton pointed out, it's actually 40 years the, this year since I left uh, Glasgow with a degree in chemistry and I've always been extremely grateful for the education that I received there because it's where I fell in love with chemistry, it's what led me to fall in love with drug discovery and development and set me off on a kind of amazing journey which has led me back now to, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, another amazing journey which is how we've uh, created this vaccine as, as John said in, in such a short time frame. So uh, next slide, please. I thought I would start with the timeline because for those who don't really know vaccine manufacturing, sometimes the numbers can be a little bit meaningless. But uh, as we mentioned, uh, 266 days from the declaration of a pandemic to uh, an authorized vaccine is kind of uh, unusually fast, let's put it that way. And uh, it's quite remarkable even today to think that a year ago from now, uh, we hadn't even started this program. And yet here we are with about 200 million doses manufactured and 60 million plus already administered across the world. I tried to find an analogy for the acceleration. This is the one I came up with. Uh, it's like going from Glasgow to New York in less than an hour relative to the six or seven hours it would probably take us if we did it today. So uh, the question really is, how does all that happen? Uh, we could spend probably days talking about this, but uh, one thing that for, is for sure, uh, none of it happens without great science and technology. So next slide. I, uh, most people are probably learning about uh, messenger RNA vaccines for the first time. So they're sort of an overnight success that took decades and decades in the making because nothing we do uh, happens without working on behalf of everybody else who's worked before us and a tremendous amount of work. This is a great practical example, maybe the greatest so far, of molecular immunology in practice. And as you'll hear probably later, Glasgow has a big part in the history of that. Um, but we were working uh, with a company called BioNTech, and I just want to kind of compare very quickly the two different uh, ways we vaccinate. 
On the left of the slide, you can see the conventional vaccine where essentially we inject an antigen. It's usually a virus, an attenuated form of it or a piece of it. And the immune system generates antibodies against that and uh, protects you the next time you see that virus. With uh, messenger RNA, it's a little bit different. Uh, we inject uh, uh, an mRNA molecule that carries a message with it. That's what the M stands for, is message. And the message is, make this protein. In this case, it will be an antigen uh, that I'll show you next. Uh, the antigen gets made, it gets expressed on the surface of our cells, and along comes the immune system, detects it, and creates both antibodies and a T-cell response, which protects you from the disease. Uh, so next slide, please. Let's look at uh, the vaccine itself, because it's not just the uh, RNA science that's really important, it's also critically important to have the right formulation. On the left side of this chart, you can see a cartoon of the virus itself, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And those sort of red things that are sticking out of the surface are what we people call the spike protein. Spike protein is very important for this virus because it's what it uses to get into and infect our cells and cause the disease. And so it's a good candidate to be our antigen. And in fact, that's what we do. Uh, we created uh, an mRNA molecule that when it's uh, introduced into human cells, sends the message, make the spike protein. And the spike protein gets expressed uh, and the immune system generates the antibodies. If you look on the right hand side, uh, though, you'll see that that uh, RNA molecule, which is the little red squiggles you can see in the very middle surrounded by the yellow blobs, uh, that's the RNA, uh, but the vaccine itself is encapsulated in what we call a lipid nanoparticle. And it's an assemblage of different lipid molecules that protects the RNA molecule because the RNA molecule is relatively sensitive, it's sensitive to temperature, and of course it has to get to its site of action. And what these lipids do for it is transport it and help it get there. So the entire thing is a thing of beauty, in my opinion. Um, but of course, we weren't able to do this without decades of work that had been done by others before we, we started out. So let's go to the next slide. So how did we do it so quickly? And the unglamorous answer to that is a lot of it was due to amazing amounts of detailed planning before we even started the study. Uh, for months before we started our clinical work, we were planning what we would do. And uh, no detail was too small to be looked at. Uh, we had a series of activities we called walking the line. Uh, for example, we took a glass vial. Where was it made? How was it transported? How does it get filled? What about the rubber stopper? How does it get to clinical research sites? We went through all of the detail of all of that uh, for every single aspect. And the concept we had was, once we start the study, we're gonna go so fast that we won't have time to solve problems that we could have foreseen. We'll only be solving problems that were not foreseeable. And hopefully the study would run in good order. And so we ran everything through what I'm calling here mission control. This is an operational dashboard we created. Uh, it has immense depth. Uh, if you were able to click on this, you would be clicking forever to get down to operational detail. That was really quite remarkable. And the most important thing about this was it's updated every six hours and it's still updated every six hours so that we know exactly what's going on at 150 different clinical research sites around the world in six different countries. And so we could manage things that were happening in the study, uh, make course corrections if we needed to in real time. And that was important because there was no other way of doing it. So uh, let's go to the next slide. We started the phase three portion of our clinical trial uh, on July 27th. It was a good day for me um, because it's my father's birthday. Uh, he was born on the 27th of July, 1927. So starting on the 27th of the 7th was a really good omen. Uh, and in fact, uh, what happened was we uh, got the regulatory green light to start the study at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon and within two hours we'd already started to those people in the trial. And you can see here the study design. It could not be simpler, actually. Uh, everyone who participates is randomly assigned, uh, blind to them and blind to us, uh, between the placebo group and the active vaccine group. And uh, once they've had two doses, they were 21 days apart, as you probably know, uh, then we just look to collect uh, cases of symptomatic COVID within the study. 
And uh, once we have sufficient cases of that, uh, we're looking obviously to see how they partition between the placebo group and the active group, and we're hoping uh, that they mostly appear in the placebo group. Next slide, please. I'll just show you one recruitment curve uh, for, the, uh, for the study. This is what we did in the United States. We were in six uh, countries in total. But uh, as you can see on this chart, we started on the 27th of July and we recruited about 28,000 people in total in the United States. And it took us about two months to do that, which is pretty rapid. Uh, what's probably not known, uh, and this is taking you inside the detail of the study, is that we were highly constrained by the amount of uh, supply of the vaccine we had in the early stages of the study. But we developed this kind of uh, thought process which said, if we have one vial left in inventory, we're okay. Actually, we don't want a lot of vials in inventory because they'd be better off in participants' arms, uh, making sure that we move as fast as we can. On the other hand, if we have zero vials in inventory, we have to stop the study because we can't vaccinate anyone. So there was a level of brinkmanship all the way along, and you can see here on the second curve, which is the darker one on the bottom, uh, the spiky one, which is our supply. Uh, there were three occasions when we came pretty close to running out of vaccine in the early part of the study, but by the time we got to September, you can see that that curve kicked up and we had sufficient supply. But these were the kind of things that we were managing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's probably more complicated than you even think here because remember we had to preserve supply for those second doses. So managing that in the early part of the study was really, really key for us. And once you get to the top of this curve, everyone's recruited, everyone's had their doses and we're really just waiting to capture the cases uh, and in order to be able to figure out what, how effective the vaccine was. So let's fast forward on the next slide to now Wednesday, uh, the 4th of November. And uh, at that point, we learned we had 94 cases and we were ready to do an analysis, take it to our external committee, who are the only ones who are able to look at the data in an unblinded way and assign the people into the different groups. And so we worked literally night and day, 24-hour uh, working, in order to assemble the data that we had and prepare it for our external data monitoring committee, which we'd scheduled at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, we had to be ready for that. Normally, this would take weeks, if not months. Uh, in fact, we did it in just a few days. We scheduled that meeting at 11 a.m. Uh, on the Sunday morning, the 8th of November. Uh, next slide. They met at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, we met, a few of us in our leadership team in the company, at 12 p.m. And we were waiting. This is why I call it the agony and the ecstasy. The top is the agony. We waited and we waited and we waited. And uh, it took us until I think it was about 2.30 in the afternoon before people started to join our call uh, with what the data monitoring committee had told us. And they basically told us uh, three things. First of all, your study has met its primary endpoint. Second of all, uh, we don't see any safety issues of concern in the study. And the third message was, and this is the big one, we really think you should take these data to regulatory authorities as quickly as possible. But the slide that you see, the photo you see at the bottom of this chart is uh, actually what happened when we discovered that we had a, a vaccine in our hands, which was 95% effective. None of us had dreamed that we would get a vaccine that effective. And that really was a moment of joy, uh, the most joyful moment in my career, I would say. On the right-hand side of the chart, you can see the data. This is from our New England Journal publication, and the red, the red line is the placebo group in the study and an accumulation of cases of COVID-19 over time. And the blue line, the, the, the one in the bottom, is the active arm of the study. If you look closely, you can see that they overlap for about the first 10 days. Uh, as those spike proteins are being expressed, as the immune system is kicking in, there really wasn't any protection for the first 10 days or so. After that, they separate pretty fast. And remember that that's still after one dose. So the second dose doesn't appear till day 21 in this, and yet this, the curves had already separated. So you can see in the active arm, they pretty much stayed flat for the rest of the study. We've never seen data like that. We couldn't have dreamed of it, uh, but of course, it's exactly what the world needed. Uh, next slide, please. 
We didn't sleep on the uh, Saturday night before this, and we certainly didn't sleep on the Sunday night uh, after we were far too wired. And it's actually tough to know something like this, and nobody else knows. But on Monday morning, the world, uh, most of it, work woke up and learned uh, of the results. And I think between Monday and Tuesday, uh, the response was almost overwhelming for us uh, who were involved in the, in the work because we had been so focused and so intensely uh, worked with our heads down uh, we didn't really understand, I don't think at that point, the impact that this, uh, this news would have. But boy did we find out, we heard from everybody, our friends, colleagues, ex-colleagues, neighbours, relatives, friends, and uh, it was a moment of hope, I think, for everyone. For us in the study, it was actually the start of even more intense work. Next slide, please. Because we didn't have regulatory authority approval uh, yet, and so we had to take all of that data. And uh, the pressure was really on at this point because we knew we had a very safe and effective vaccine and we needed to get it out. We were acutely aware that thousands of people were dying every day. And the time that we took was literally costing 4,000 lives in the United States alone every day. And so we worked very intensively. Uh, normally, when we submit these kind of data, we do it over a secure web portal. Uh, in this case, we got a call from the US Secret Service and they said, no, no, we're not gonna do that. Uh, in this case, it's too important a data set. We're gonna give you this encrypted hard drive that you can see on the right here. And we're gonna come and get it from you and we're gonna drive it down to the US FDA. So the team got together on the Thursday evening and uh, they worked all night assembling the documentation. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, the, the thing was collected. It was collected at 1 p.m. on uh, the Friday afternoon. And sure enough, uh, they came and fortunately we remember the password they'd given us because without that they wouldn't have taken it away. But uh, they took it away and they got it to the regulators that same day and they started reviewing it that same day. On the left of this slide, you see a screenshot of the team who have been meeting every day since last May. Uh, these are the leaders of the clinical team, the different disciplines involved, and uh, they're just an amazing group of people. None of them would describe themselves as extraordinary, but what they are, are masters of all their disciplines, and they are certainly been doing extraordinary work. And then next slide. Of course, John talked about uh, you know, Margaret Keenan on the left of this. This is very emotional still for me because, and I'll just uh, mention on the right hand side, on the right of the chart, you can see uh, Sandra Lindsay and she runs uh, the, in the intensive care unit at Jewish Medical Center in Queens, New York, just in Pfizer's backyard. And when it comes to protecting nurses and people who work in ICUs, that is the most meaningful thing to everyone who worked on this study. It really does mean the world to us to see that happening. And we've been so fortunate to see so many and people send us photographs of this work uh, constantly. And it, uh, it really is moving every single time we, we see it. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Rachel and then I think we're going to go into questions. Rod, John, thank you so much for that incredible insight into what was delivered by Pfizer in a mere 266 days. I can't quite get my head around that still. Um, I actually felt really quite emotional listening to you both. I mean, this actually has been the one thing that has given us all hope. Um, and the work that you have been able to deliver is both extraordinary and historic. Um, and with that, I really want to take the opportunity now to bring back in uh, Ian and Emma as well, because um, Ian, maybe just coming to you first, if I may, this, this clearly is an extraordinary feat of modern molecular medicine. How do you view this achievement in the context of the history of immunology and virus research? Well, I, I, I'm with you, Rachel. I, I found that emotional. I found it extraordinary and I found it inspirational. I, I, I guess listening, John, to you and Rod talking out loud, I heard you talking about teamwork. Uh, I heard you talking about technologies. Um, but what I heard especially was you talking about 2021 capitalizing on how many decades 
of understanding and learning the development of a molecular medicine heritage that when man, womankind needed it, we were able to draw down on what we had invested in over so many decades. Now, I, I'm a clinician, I'm also an immunologist, of course, so I would say this anyway, wouldn't I? But, you know, understanding how the body defends itself, how, how the immune system works, it's just so fundamental now to numerous diseases that we face. It's, it's fundamental, of course, to diseases of the immune system, arthritis and, and, and similar conditions. It's fundamental to understanding, in fact, outcomes in cancer. Uh, we, we understand many cardiovascular diseases have immune dysfunction underlying them. And, and then, of course, if you like, the, the most important topic of the age, how, how do we defend ourselves against infection, particularly viral infection? And uh, I guess the final thought I had listening to you both was how proud I am to be a, both a Glasgow graduate and still a, a Glasgow-based academic. Uh, to see two of our alumni doing such extraordinary things. And you're about to meet Emma as well, who's one of our uh, current staff who's doing extraordinary things, I have to say, and we'll, we'll hear about that momentarily. Um, and, and finally, maybe just to say that, you know, immunology is kind of embedded in our own DNA in Glasgow. We, we've been thinking about the immune system for more than half a century. Uh, the original, uh, after the, the Second World War, the, the transplants for the the terribly harmed pilots who were treated in Canisburn. And then over half a century of education, one of the oldest and still most successful undergraduate immunology degrees that this university offers. And now world-class immune translational immune biology, understanding mechanisms of arthritis, cardiovascular and, and cancer processes, all of these coming together, really Glasgow playing its part in the world. But what I would also say is that we have a, a truly wonderful integration of immune biology and infection biology in the College of Medical Veterinary Life Sciences, and none more so than with the MRC Centre for Virus Research, exemplified in the extraordinary work that Emma and her colleagues have been doing. And I, Rachel, I, I, I think I'm the, I'm the warm-up act for the real star in virus research in Glasgow. And I'm, I'm going to hand back to you because I'd really love to hear what Emma has to say on this subject for sure. Thank you so much for that, Ian. Um, there are no warm-ups on this panel, you are all stars, uh, first and foremost, but I am gonna take the opportunity now to, to pose a question to, to Emma. So, you know, Emma, we, we've celebrated the news of this vaccine and of those from AstraZeneca and Moderna, um, but we have also heard the news, and um, more so now than ever before, of new variants, new mutations of COVID-19. Um, and that has really um, raised questions about the effectiveness of the vaccines for certain groups, particularly those with vulnerabilities. And um, as the lead in a number of efficacy studies, um, as you are for the University of Glasgow, what can you tell us about the effectiveness of the COVID, vaccine, the COVID vaccines in these circumstances? Fundamentally, I think everyone wants to know, are they still going to work? <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. And um, I'd like to take this very rare opportunity as a Pfizer vaccine recipient to say thank you directly to those that have helped to develop it. I, I work as an infectious diseases physician here in Glasgow, 20% uh, of my time, and then the other 80% in the laboratory. Um, and um, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> I would highly recommend vaccination to anyone who can get their hands on it um, with this fantastic vaccine. So. Um, uh, yeah, the question about new variants in particular and, and variations in the genome of the virus that might um, be important in terms of vaccination. And, and uh, this is something that we've been working on quite hard in the UK as part of the COG UK consortium, which um, I'm, I'm on the uh, steering committee of and uh, very involved in sequencing many thousands of uh, viral sequences from across the UK. Uh, we've we've done we've now sequenced more than 250,000 uh, virus genomes, and um, that actually represents quite a, a large amount of the global diversity of the virus. And so we've been tracking quite carefully how the virus changes over time. And uh, one of the early uh, work that I've been involved in was to look at the plasticity of the virus, so how how easily it changes shape, uh, particularly within the parts of the virus, the the spike. Um, protein, which is important in terms of uh, both antibody responses as well as 
T cell responses, but it's critical for it's that bit of the virus that binds directly to the receptor in the lungs, the ACE2 receptor. And um, it's that bit that's very important, obviously, uh, as, as a, a, a target within vaccines. So the final common pathway of most vaccines uh, or all vaccines involves the spike protein. Um, and so if that, we, we found early on that the changes within that spike protein can actually affect um, antibody responses. And uh, so antibody responses from people who were infected in the first wave of infection with slightly different uh, virus variants uh, seems to be slightly reduced uh, in, in people who, uh, who've been infected with variants uh, in our second wave, which is almost like a second and a third wave uh, in the UK, um, and that's been seen and reflected all around the world. So the question is, how much can the virus vary and how important is that with regard to vaccines? So uh, definitely vaccines are very effective. I don't think there's any question about that, but there are some changes within the genome which are concerning us at the moment. Um, that's not unexpected. Viruses are expected to evolve over time. And um, I, I think, uh, well, I'd be very interested to hear from those in Pfizer, but um, my impression is that the most companies and the most people that, who are vaccine developers are thinking along the lines of boosters, uh, which will need to incorporate changes that occur over time. And we've seen an, a variant in particular. So initially the virus actually looked like it wasn't evolving very rapidly, but suddenly we uh, these uh, new variants popped up with constellations of changes in the in the genome, so multiple changes that are affecting the shape of that spike uh, protein. And um, uh, we know that uh, one of the variants which uh, uh, arose in South Africa, for example, is significantly impacting on some vaccine, uh, some vaccines in terms of their efficacy, uh, particularly the um, AstraZeneca Oxford Chadox one vaccine and also the uh, Novavax uh, vaccine. And so, uh, however, um, the changes that we've seen in there um, would be pretty easy to tweak, I think, in, in forthcoming uh, design of, of vaccines. And um, I would anticipate that boosters will become available to us in due course, which are designed to, to tackle those. So at the moment, in most countries around the world, the vaccines are going to work really well. Um, uh, they, they will provide some protection against uh, the, the new variants variants of the virus that are a bit more worrying in countries like uh, South Africa, but um, it's likely that we will need to keep on top of this and uh, help with redesign in the future. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Emma. And, and John, I can see you nodding away there when <laughs> Emma was talking about boosters in particular. So I, I, I'll maybe just um, ask you to come in on that point, you know, whether that is the plan that boosters will have to be uh, developed um, as, as part of our, our fight against the pandemic. Um, and I'll then maybe kind of segue into another question um, that's being asked, which is, you know, are vaccine manufacturers in competition with one another? You know, and, and then what does that mean for those of us who are, you know, waiting to be immunised? So, John, over to you. No, thank, thanks for the question. Um, I think the first thing, you know, I'll answer your second question first, which is we've been very clear that the world needs um, lots of vaccine. And so we have certainly hoped that we would not be the only company to be successful in developing a safe and effective vaccine. And a vaccine needs to be both, given how many people it's given to. So, you know, as Rod uh, mentioned in his comments, you know, safety has been just as important as effectiveness as we've developed our vaccine. Uh, and we are not in competition with anybody. But there are 8 billion people almost on the face of the planet. And given the interconnectedness of our world, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And we are very clear that we need to play our role in that, but we hope that others are successful as well. So I'll just take that first. Um, in terms of uh, the work that, that we're doing, just to build on Emma's uh, comments, it plainly is something that you know is a very important question and we're laser focused on it. Um, so what we're doing is, first of all, uh, we've conducted and will continue to conduct some in vitro studies to look at the effectiveness, essentially taking a serum or plasma from patients who have been vaccinated already with our existing vaccine, and then looking at the effectiveness of the neutralizing antibodies from our current vaccine against new variants. Uh, so we published some of that data, we'll publish more. To date, we see similar levels of effectiveness in uh, when we look at the UK variant, the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant, but that is something that we need to continue to, to monitor. 
Uh, encouragingly, uh, we've also seen some real world data from Israel, for example, that suggests that you see a similar level of effectiveness in real world settings where you have um, probably more than a million patients now being vaccinated rather than just the several thousand patients in our study. But I think we're under new illusions that, you know, neither we nor anybody else can rest on our laurels. So the two things that we're doing are, first of all, uh, we are uh, in discussions with the FDA to look at whether a booster um, uh, for patients have already received two doses of our vaccine. If we give a, a third dose of a vaccine um, to those patients, if we boost the immune response uh, further, whether that will confer additional effectiveness even against new variants. So we don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's a really important study to, to run and Rod's group are, are running that. And then the second question is, do we believe that you see a variant you know, that expresses conformational changes, as Emma said, where the, the very nature of the immune protection that our current vaccine confers requires you to develop a, a new or upgraded uh, vaccine against a new variant? And so that is something that we are actively in discussions with the FDA and other regulators about. Um, so far, as I said, the current vaccine appears to be similarly effective, but we can certainly envision that you know, there's going to be a time where uh, developing uh, a, a, an upgraded vaccine, if I can use that term against the new variant, may very well be um, uh, something that's important. And so that is something that we're actively in discussions with FDA and other regulators on now. Rod, I don't know whether you'd like to add to that. Well, I think you've covered it very well, John. The, the only thing I would add is that you know, clearly uh, what we've got to make sure of is that no, no other variant ever reaches a pandemic level. And the challenge for us there will be making sure that uh, if a real nasty one appears, and I think so far we would argue we've probably got reasonable coverage, at least with our vaccine. Um, but if one does appear, uh, then we really need to move even faster than we've moved to this point. And uh, that's the challenge that we face now, because uh, we're going to have to go uh, even quicker and make the distribution networks uh, going even faster and more productively uh, than we saw the first time around. And I think that's, that's really where we're very focused uh, at the moment. And if I can maybe just stay on, on that theme for just a second, because I'm, I'm kind of looking at some of the chat that's coming through um, and there's lots, which is great. So thank you all for everyone that's kind of posting up questions and commenting as, as we're running through um, this, this session. Um, quite a few are reflecting on the fact that, is there a real concern that the delay in the rollout of vaccination programs, and um, particularly in the developing world, could lead to more dangerous variants developing? Um, you know, and, and, and what can we do about that, if anything? So I don't know whether Rod or John, you want to comment on that. Sure, I think, you know, when we talk about the world, uh, clearly we're so connected now that it's probably easier now, but it's not, it not possible to fully isolate anywhere in the world. So I think we have to be concerned about variants wherever they come from. And we need to have very rapid systems, as John mentioned, to evaluate them, see whether we have coverage. And if we don't, we need to get after them really quickly. Uh, and I think though the, the global systems of doing that, and maybe Emma can actually comment, she's probably closer to that work than, than even than we are, um, you know, will be in place because we have to move, you know, even faster if, if that's possible uh, than we did the first time around. Uh, so, you know, I think I'm reasonably confident that that will happen, uh, that uh, the industry now and everybody else in the, in the system will be able to handle it if one of these variants emerges from wherever. Uh, I think the, the, clearly the message on current vaccinations is, you know, we should be vaccinating at the max rate we possibly can with all the supply of all the effective vaccines uh, in every country in the world. And uh, that has clearly got to be our mission for, for the next several months. And Rod, if I can maybe just stay with you, um... You know, do you think that with the right funding and attention, all vaccines could be developed as quickly as the Pfizer one in the future? Well, I, well, well you said a key phrase with the right funding, uh, you know, kind <laughs> of uh, that would definitely help. But, uh, you know, our company, as you probably know, we committed a very large amount of money 
whether it worked or not. And, uh, you know, it did work and we were prepared to uh, swallow that if it didn't work. But you probably couldn't do that for every program that you run, otherwise you wouldn't last very long uh, as an organization. Uh, so it, it probably is not possible to do this for every single thing at this speed. However, what I would say is we have learned tremendous lessons from this work uh, that we think will benefit every program, whether it's a vaccine or a therapeutic medicine. We've redefined the time it takes us to do much. Uh, we've redefined our interactions with regulatory authorities and uh, we've redefined the technology that we use to run studies. So there will be a big payoff, I think, in terms of making sure that if someone's got cancer, uh, they're not going to have to wait a lot longer uh, because they've got cancer than they did if, because of COVID. And it's really incumbent upon all of us who are involved in this work to, to capture all these lessons. But I wouldn't look to see every program go at this speed because uh, it only went at uh, that speed in the distribution because we knew that when we had an authorized vaccine, we had to be able to supply it at large scale and therefore we had to make these investments way ahead of whether we knowing that whether it would work or not. And uh, that would be true again, I think, for another uh, variant potentially, but I wouldn't expect to see every single program move quite that fast. And are there, I mean, again, we're, we're, we're getting some comments on the chat coming through that, you know, are there any safety concerns in running trials as, as quickly as, you know, Pfizer have had to? Um, you know, is, is that something that we have to be very mindful of? Very mindful, actually. And uh, going in, I don't know if you saw the dashboard we had, we got regular updates basically every week. Uh, we were reviewing all of the safety data that we had in front of us. Um, at that time, it's all blinded data, so you don't know where it sits, but uh, we reviewed all of it. The quality of the study um, was also something that we monitored and we re referenced uh, it back to previous studies we'd run to make sure that as we went quickly, we weren't uh, sacrificing anything in quality or seeing anything unusual. Um, so it was very much to our mind, and in fact, what I've discovered is that if anything, uh, the quality that we ran here, because I think the intensity, the focus and people's understanding of the critical importance was, if anything, even greater than our regular work. Um, on the safety side, I think we had a very extensive uh, database when we went into uh, the, uh, the regulatory discussions. And now, of course, with uh, more than 60 million doses uh, already administered worldwide, we're pretty, uh, pretty confident, uh, at least on the acute sense, of the safety of the vaccine. Of course, what we don't know yet, nobody knows, is long term because uh, we've no reason to suspect any challenges. But of course, people have not been on the vaccine for more than about six to seven months. Uh, so no reason to worry uh, at all about that. But uh, we've very much focused on it. And even to this day, we still have every couple of days an update on safety. And uh, we still to this day see no signals that worry us. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thank you so much for that, Rod. Um, now, as we know, sadly, uh, COVID-19 is not the first, nor sadly, um, is it likely to be the last pandemic that we face. Um, Ian, I'm going to maybe turn to you. What would you say have been some of the main lessons learned from the experience so far in managing the pandemic, um, either in terms of the actual vaccine development itself or in terms of kind of government policies that have been put into place uh, to help stop the spread of the virus? Yeah, th thanks, Rachel, for almost all of the question. The last bit was a real joy to hear. Um, so maybe I'll start with the optimistic part, which is that in an, if you think about it, it's, a, it's about a century since the Spanish flu pandemic after the First World War, which in an evolutionary sense is a blink of the eye of humanity. And yet today we are having a rational conversation about the sequence of the virus, the synthesis of a vaccine based at the molecular level, the inoculation of tens of thousands of people and data moving freely around the world in nanosecond time to allow investigators like Emma and myself and others to start to cogitate on how we can use that to combat a pandemic in real time. 
And in an evolutionary blink of an eye, we, we've gone from massive, terrible ill health in 1919 to in 2021, a global tragedy, make no mistake, but nevertheless, a response in the era of molecular medicine, which is simply breathtaking. And so the, the first thing I would say if I was sitting listening to this conversation is what an incredibly optimistic view we should have of our future, not only in managing this pandemic, but also in managing future pandemics, we will be more pandemic prepared, I venture to suggest. But also something that I think Rod and John alluded to in their remarks, the molecular advances that we've consolidated, if you like, and fine-tuned in pandemic responsiveness will be expertises that we can now bring to molecular solutions for the treatment of cancer the treatment of heart disease, the treatment of inflammatory immune-mediated diseases, and yes, to the treatment of the many, many other infectious diseases that afflict large parts of the world. There will be people in developing countries scratching their heads who've been suffering from um, endemic malaria and a whole number of other parasitic illnesses. They'll be saying, you know, actually infectious diseases have been a big part of our economic life for the last number of of decades. And so in terms of the contribution molecular medicine will make in future, I'm incredibly optimistic. I guess the other piece, and maybe Emma would want to come in here, has been the, the sense of cooperation and collaboration between academic institutions, between pharma and academic institutions. It's wonderful to have John and Rod joining us today, but the truth is we actually work together and we have done for decades, but now I think it's very publicly obvious that the solution is for pharma and academic science and clinicians to work together with the NHS, with other healthcare providers, but also particularly to work with government and trying to integrate national level policy with what molecular medicine is capable of delivering. And I, I, I think we've learned enormous lessons in that. And I rather suspect going forward, those lessons will be very effectively applied yeah, that's, that's great i mean and yes um ian thank you for uh introducing emma back into the into the conversation emma it would be great to get your, your take on the on the same question if that's okay i think that the um the interconnectedness of this world and the massive sort of technological advances that that um have been made are are extraordinary and we will be well placed to deal with other um, pandemics, I guess, should they happen again in our lifetime. Um, and in fact, I think that we have to expect that they might because of the intricate so sort of double edged sword. Um, th there are going to be more risks in terms of uh, uh, viruses, uh, particularly RNA viruses um, emerging from hotspots around the world. And I think we need to look quite hard at um, at the, for example, this virus in parts of the world in which there's a lot of transmission, because that seems to be where the new variants are emerging. So if you look in South Africa, Brazil, the UK, uh, there's a variant which has some concerning um, mutations in the US as well. Um, so those, those places are, are where we've seen very high levels of transmission. And so we have to try to um, capitalize on the extraordinary advances that have happened in terms of our interconnectedness. And I, I've met so many new colleagues in the US and all around the world, and um, we've been working on the science together very openly. And, and I'd like to see that that might be something that we could maintain uh, for science in the future and um, that we find ways of talking to each other. Um, I think Zoom has, a, has a, had a massive sort of contribution on science. Um, and um, uh, the interconnectedness that's now possible and also the, the kind of sequencing technologies probably are very helpful in terms of uh, identifying pathogens early. Uh, if you look at HIV, it took um, 60 years or so to <laughs> sequence it. Um, it took a very short amount of time to sequence this. And then, of course, that's formed the recipe for the, um, uh, vaccines and, so, uh, and will form the recipe if it's required for, for um, vaccines in the future for, for boosters so um yeah i think uh, it would be i think we do have to have a global view i think that would be my last 
point, um, it's not possible to separate ourselves from the rest of the world. And so not only do we have a global responsibility for other countries, but actually also we are going to import new variants mm -hmm. if we don't look at how to vaccinate uh, other countries and other parts of the world, including low and middle income countries. Yeah, you know, I think that's a fantastic point. And um, I, I'd like to turn now to um, to John and Rod. And, and John, um, just, just to kind of start with you, you know, what would you say the main lessons uh, that have been learned from the Pfizer experience of developing the vaccine? And what will be the consequences and opportunities for Pfizer in the future, do you think? So we also spent quite a lot of time, uh, you know, thinking about that ourselves. And I think Rod has touched on, you know, a lot of that, you know, in, in his comments already, which I won't repeat. But I think we've certainly proven that having much more real time uh, discussion with regulators, you know, much more uh, timely sharing of data, getting feedback enables us as one of the enablers, at least, of helping us to move more quickly. Uh, but certainly one of the things that we are, we are um, spending a lot of time thinking about is with the learnings that we've now got, you know, having uh, demonstrated RNA vaccine is not just a great concept, but actually appears to have a very efficacious, but also a safe uh, profile. Um, is how we can apply that learning to some of the original problems that we started uh, our research program along with BioNTech uh, a number of years ago now to, to try and solve. So certainly one of the things that we're looking at is given, as I mentioned in my comments, that seasonal flu, for example, um, uh, it still kills um, thousands of people around the world every year. Um, vaccines, you know, because of the the way that you know flu mutates, uh, you know, very, fairly rapidly, uh, oftentimes because of the development uh, timelines for existing um, traditional vaccines, you end up with sort of uh, a vaccine in any one year that may not be effective. So we think some of the capabilities that mRNA vaccines uh, have demonstrated actually are highly applicable to bring more effective and more accurately targeted. Uh, vaccines for diseases like seasonal flu and potentially for other infectious diseases too. So I won't go into all of the, the work and, and thinking that we're doing, but certainly we're looking to very actively apply the lessons that we've learned from this program and then think about how we can uh, extrapolate those and extend those to make an impact to positively improve the outcomes in a whole bunch of other diseases, infectious and otherwise, where we know outcomes uh, are still poor for many patients around the world. Great. And Rod, do you have any final words that you would want to add? Well, just that um, in my neck of the woods, when we're doing clinical trials right across all of our different therapeutic areas, and uh, pretty much everything has changed, quite honestly, because uh, we can't do what we just did uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine and then be satisfied for people with life-threatening conditions and rare diseases and cancers with something less. And so I'm spending quite a lot of my time with the rest of our teams. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that when we started this work, we would, all of us, particularly the more experienced people, would have believed it was impossible to do this in this time frame. And the real truth of it is it became possible because we decided to do it. And then a lot of very experienced people put their minds to it and everything else that went with it. But, you know, we can't just rest there it has to change an awful lot about what we do and we're talking with other teams who weren't part of this work to change the mindsets and expectations because it has to flow through uh, into every other aspect of what we do that's great and i think um you know one of the kind of overpowering messages of today's event for me has actually been that of hope and of optimism. And I think it will be a really heartening message for everyone that's joining us because of the real challenges we have faced over the course of the last year. And, you know, are we going to see, if not a complete end to the pandemic um, anytime soon, um, the chance for us to kind of reset and recover from COVID-19 in the short term? And I guess that's open to anyone. Um, I'm sort of seeing some nodding, nodding heads, some tentative nodding heads. So I think, I think there's there's lots of cause for us to be optimistic. I guess is is, is what I'm hoping that we'll be able to end this session with. Yeah. I, 
I, uh, Rachel, I, I'm happy to take up the charge. I, I'm incredibly optimistic. I think molecular medicine is up to the challenge. And when it's driven by the kind of extraordinary minds that have come together to, in common purpose, address these challenges that we've faced in this pandemic and the many other medical challenges that still sit in front of us, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. I'm also really excited to see Glasgow graduates having this conversation and projecting the underlying values that we have as an organization, not just within Glasgow, within the UK, but on the global stage. And, and that also, I have to say, from a, a university perspective, fills me both with pride, but also with optimism. Uh, we will think our way out of this problem. And I'm very confident molecular medicine will deliver. And that's a fantastic note to end on, Ian. And I'm so, so grateful that we've been able to have this conversation and share it with our global community of alums, of partners, friends, students, staff, and of course, prospective students. So to all of our prospective students watching, you're making a great decision. Yes. And um, if, you haven't, if you haven't heard back from us yet in terms of the application, I promise you we're on it. Uh, you'll be receiving, receiving information from us shortly. Um, but hopefully that gives you um, real faith in the quality of the academic community that you will be joining at the University of Glasgow. And um, I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today's event. And um, thank you so much again to our guest speakers, to Rod McKenzie and to John Young for your incredible insights on the Pfizer journey. Um, but also to our University of Glasgow panellists, Professor Ian McInnes and Professor Emma Thompson for all of the incredible work that you have been leading on as well, both within the university and across the sector. Um, thank you to our Principal and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, for uh, joining us at the start and kicking off uh, today's event. Um, and lastly, to you, our global audience, for joining us. Um, we're enormously grateful that you were taking the time to connect in with us and we hope that you continue to choose to do so. Um, as before, a link to this recording will be circulated um, along with um, an ask for some feedback. Uh, we're constantly seeking to improve on the events that we're delivering and your evaluation uh, really helps to inform our thinking in this space. So if you can take a few minutes to complete that, um, it would be really, really appreciated. Uh, as you know, uh, this is the second in our World Changing Glasgow Conversation series. Um, it is a change to our advertised programming. Uh, we thought it was uh, really highly relevant and timely and topical to have the discussion today about the development of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we had planned on having a discussion around mental health, which of course is also um, a really, really important topic. Uh, for us all at this time. Uh, so you'll be pleased to hear that our next uh, conversation in April will be on the subject of mental health and we'll be in touch soon with you uh, to let you know how to register for that. I hope that many of you will rejoin the conversation at that time. As always, many thanks for listening and for engaging. Um, it's goodbye for now, but we really do look forward to connecting again with you soon. And in the meantime, stay safe and take care. Thank you very much.